No mai hoki mai to this, the afternoon session from the Collaborative Aotearoa Symposium. What an amazing day we've had so far. So many opportunities to be inspired and to fill our kete matauranga um, as was challenged at the beginning of the day. I have the absolute privilege of opening this afternoon session. Um, I would like to offer the opportunity to um, welcome Helmut Modlik, Modlik um, to the stage. His professional background is absolutely stunning. A recognised and respected leader in his own right, his all today would challenge us to consider the importance of grassroots leadership to true and authentic transformation. In many ways, he is a modern day Maui, a navigator. Maui also was a bit cheeky, and some could say he was also a disruptor. Humai te paki paki, or helmet modlik. Well, that's a first. Kia ora no tato. I actually said, just say that I'm a Maori boy from Purirua with a flash, ma na flash name. Um, <laughs> well, kia ora everyone. I know this is the toughest slot in the day, and I'm glad I'm not dead last. I just saying to Mark that he's got the toughest gig. But look, it is a privilege to be with you today. It's actually, um, I've been in and out of health for most of uh, the last 30 years. <clears throat> and it's because of the importance of the mahi and uh, that, that we're all... Uh, a part of more or less um, that that's led me to do so and I've come along here today though to be a little bit just, I think I was described as being a little bit cheeky well I'm going to be a little bit provocative in what I've got to say but it's with the best interest in heart be, uh, because I am very respectful and grateful to every single one in the room I know you wouldn't be here and you wouldn't be associated with this collaboration if you if you didn't have great hearts and you weren't committed to the um, achievement of equitable health outcomes for our community and our Māori and Pacifica whānau in particular. So in that spirit, um, uh, take what I have to offer, please. So I'm, I'm really going to cover, and I don't have any slides because I, I never made my mind up what I was going to say until, I think I still haven't made my mind up, so we'll see where we, we, see where we land. Um, but, but I'm generally going to speak on two things. Um, uh, quickly at the beginning about bringing knives to gunfights. And, um, and then secondly, I'd like to, to talk about something a bit more sensitive, um, but, but challenging, and that I invite you to ponder. So the, the, the knife gunfight illusion. So um, uh, I'm reliably advised from the literature that um, our health uh, service provision accounts for less than 20% of what actually uh, supports the achievement of health and well-being. You know, the 80 plus percent arises um, out of uh, things outside the core health sector, our, our um, you know, wider social determinants of health and well-being. Um, it seems to me, therefore, if that's true, and it is, that um, a narrow focus on core health service delivery is akin to bringing a knife to a gunfight if our actual outcome that we're after is that holistic well-being. Now, you know, I'm not in charge of the world and you're not in charge of the full spectrum of, you know, social determinant and drivers and delivery for well-being. But, but I'm, I'm here today to be the little boy that says the emperor's got no clothes on. So that at least we're, we're being honest about what it is we're doing and what we're not doing and what we're seeing. So Marty Tour's response to this um, multifactorial problem that we have is to stand up something we call our Modi order ecosystem. Oh, and there's, there's so many faces that I know I'm, I'm holding back from saying hello to, to various people in the room. Um, so, yeah, so health and wellbeing is driven from you know, multifactorial problems, um, but the, the way that our public service is organised and our system is funded and accountable and delivered is in silos and, and whānau, that's a fail. We all know that. So Ngāti is not playing that game anymore, and so we're increasingly standing up an integrated ecosystem of uh, both professional support, we'll start there, that delivers, yes, core health services, um, but also housing and employment and education to mea to mea. Now, that's a journey, obviously, and ultimately it's a 360-degree thing, but 
the, the, the point is that our vision, we believe, is, is coherent. And the trick, of course, will be uh, not only standing up and optimizing, but integrating and all the rest of it. But I just wanted to put that out there, that that is the beginning point for us. And I, and I just also want to throw in uh, a, another material observation, which is relevant to where I actually want to spend most of my time. Actually, speaking of time, the battery on my watch died. So can someone give me a watch? Because I don't know when I'm supposed to finish. Please. Kia ora for that. Look at that. I told you there's good people here. What time am I done? It's 4.09. What time am I done? All right, better hurry up. So, um, right. So, uh, life's a roller coaster for all of us. And um, whenever it goes down for us, we always turn immediately first to the people who know and love us first, right? Our family and friends. And usually that's enough. And the support and, and so on that's in the play will help us to get back on even keel and away we go. But on occasion, that's not enough. And the trajectory steeps heading, keeps heading down. And then we usually need to draw on professional, uh, specialized and dedicated support for a wee bit to hopefully get us back on an even keel and away we go. The point I'm trying to make is that the fundamental place of our personal and private networks of support are impossible to overstate for the importance of everybody, let alone the community of which we're we're wanting to help. Now that community of people and their their um, their personal network, unfortunately, all too often either overburdened, right, missing, or otherwise challenged to be able to actually provide and sufficient, you know, to provide the help that's needed. But it's a very material observation to my mind that not only should we be creating an ecosystem of professionally integrated support services but we need to also be explicitly identifying, engaging with, informing, and integrating into that ecosystem the personal networks, leverage, strengthening and leveraging those personal networks to appropriately participate in the well-being journey of our whanau. Right? So I've, I've already started framing up the conversation in, in a way that, you know, it was, oh, we only do this slice, we'll kill for that. It ain't going to get us there. It ain't going to get us there. So that's the first bit of bad news um, in one sense, but of good news in another sense. The rest of the time I'd like to focus on what I do see as being a particularly particularly um, ch big challenge that confronts us now with the reforms. So I was invited to be a part of a Ministry of Health, as it turns out, Ministry of Health workshop late 2020 to brainstorm about how we might leverage the lessons of the Team of the, mir the, the miracle of the team of five million to um, achieve at that time uh, universal COVID tracing or something approximating to it. And then ultimately, by you know, in due course, and the expectation was that a vaccine would arise and then arrive. And then, and then how do we actually get something like universal uh, vaccine uptake? And uh, the early question that was asked was so, what, what other example do we have of public policy? Um, delivery and outcome where we get something approximating to universality. No one in the room could think of a single example, not one. Fresh water, no food, no housing, no uh, roads, no nothing. Now, uh, you, you could have knocked me over with a feather at that, at that conclusion. Because where my mind immediately went was, if there is no examples, then it can't be because the people involved are stupid, don't have good hearts, don't work enough. It must be systemic. Right. I'd, I'd draw a parallel that if all of you good people that are clearly very clever, clearly have good hearts, clearly work way too long, are not able to achieve the universality of outcome and you know that we're after an equality of outcome, it must be systemic. So don't beat yourself up. By definition, you can't um, do what's needed. All right, so I'm looking back at you now, Martin. Responsible for part of the reforms, count for that. So the reforms do go some way clearly at a macro level, and and but for me more importantly, they're permissive of and enabling of what I think is needed going forward. So what does that include? 
and I'm not going to touch it all on structural related issues because that's not where the, for me where the real oil is. I recently listened to and thank you to uh, Amadil, I think sent it to me a a, a remarkable um, gentleman by the name of uh, Kyle Eagleton who was sharing the story and I think many of you will have heard uh, Kyle share on the webinar his journey of uh, introspection and personal change to be a more effective uh, agent for change in the, the people he seeks to support through their own healing and well-being journey in the far north. Um, and it reminded me of um, uh, a character in the story, Les Mis. I actually went to Les Mis last night. This is my low energy version. Um, we were up way too late last night, but it was such an awesome story. I love it. I watched this story for the first time, uh, the um, um, uh, uh, a movie of it 25 or so years ago. Um, hands up those who know the story of Les Mis, Jean Valjean and the priest. All right, I've got to tell the story because not everybody knows. So short version, Jean Valjean, 1815, five-year-old Frenchman, gone to jail, French boy, gone to jail, stealing bread, stays in jail for 20 years, gets let out. He's been brutalized. He's a monster. Tries to get help, tries to get food, tries to get shelter. No one will help him. Finally, an old priest lets him in, feeds him. Um, puts him to bed during the night. Jean Valjean gets up, cracks him on the head, steals his silver, runs off. Next morning, gendarmes turn up, uh, saying to the old priest, this um, crook stole your stuff. He said you gave it to him. The priest says he did. Gendarmes uh, walk away. Jean Valjean, what? The priest says, Jean Valjean, you left some behind. Tells the nun, go get the rest, brings it out, gives it to Jean Valjean, and he leans into Jean Valjean, and more or less he says to him, Jean Valjean, with the silver I have bought your soul, now go. Make of yourself a good man. I watched that movie 25, 6, whatever years ago. Again, you could have knocked me over the feather with that. Two observations. First off, how easy was it to systemically brutalize and harm a soul and turn an ordinary boy into a monster? We do it every day. How easy is that? The second thing, though, that I've been pondering for that 25 years is how hard it is to heal a soul. How do you systemically do what that priest did? Good trick, right? Because to my mind, as I've considered over the years, the, 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 the oil, the secret source, was that that priest got inside Jean Valjean and enabled him to see things he didn't see before, to... Um, hope for things that he didn't know existed and to then with the opportunity and the resource had given him to send him on and the, and the movie's the, about the rest of what happens awesome go see it it's at the st james if you want to see a local version my point um the journey that jean valjean and carl eglinton have gone to by definition are extraordinary all right Māori people love the fact that our non-Māori whānau and colleagues want to be effective agent for change in the well-being of our people. The challenge, though, whānau is, and I'm just speaking honestly and personally, I don't believe enough of you will love us enough to pay the price, to do what it'll take, to be like Carl and to be like the old priest. If you're up for it, Kiakaha, you're my new best friend. But that's the reality of it. That's the reality of the challenge as healers. Let me just give you some other related um, sentiments to make the point. Stephen Covey in his book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, steered, uh, shared at the start of the story of the, uh, of the book, The Power of Paradigms, told the story of the, um, the man standing on train station, noticed a father come onto the platform with some kids. They're running around, making a racket, bothering people. He, the, the man notices the father, says nothing, does nothing, gets all wound up, wound up. Eventually goes up to the father and says, excuse me, sir, do you notice your kids are making a nuisance? Can you do something, please? The father turns to him and says, I'm so sorry, sir. We just came from the hospital. Their mother died. I don't know what to say to them. Covey makes the point that in the instant of that, that story concluding, everyone who reads and hears that story makes an instant shift in here and in here. And the interesting observation is that the facts are all the same. Nothing changes in the facts, but everything changes. One instant, you want to crack someone, growl someone. Next instant, full of empathy, aroha, how can I help? Everything changes, right? 
The point is, the truth is, we all think we see the world as it is, but the truth is we see the world as we are. All right? And it's really hard to change. I was at a uh, conference uh, the college ran a few years. Some of you would have been there, and the um, English professor of um, general practice that was the keynote speaker began very provocati provocatively by saying something like after 50 years of general practice and he'd looked back on his experience as a GP, um, of course, the majority of the people he'd, he'd, he'd met with, they would have got better no matter what he did, so we'll put them to one side. And then of all the rest, um, on reflection, he had concluded that most of what he'd done had done nothing. And then for a certain proportion, some of what he'd done had subsequently you know, shown that it was bad that would probably hurt them. And so he said, um, and this was the key point, uh, after 50 years of general practice, the only thing I can say hand on heart that I ever did over that period that I know made a difference was I cared and I listened. Now, this is a hall full of GPs, and I thought, well, you're good on you. He was obviously trying to make a number of points other than getting everybody's attention, but one of the points that I took away from it was we're not as good as we think we are. That our Western evidence-based organic machine pharmacentric model of care, it's got some significant limitations and it's not as good as I think it is. Indigenous people the worldwide, including the Māori people in, in this land, uh, have and prefer a more holistic vision and model of the human condition that accounts for not only our you know, our physiological, organic, tangible self, but of course, all of the other spiritual, cultural, emotional, and other dimensional aspects of the human condition. And, and uh, to my mind, the question isn't who's right. Uh, to my mind, you know, because we don't want to get into babies and bathwater sort of a discussion. The, 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 to my mind, the question is whose opinion matters most? Who needs to change? Who needs to heal? You know, and as I said, um, if, if we don't see the world as it is, we see it as we are. And if the people we're looking to help don't see the world, uh, well, we're, we're doing that, aren't we? Can I just give a practical example? It's a little bit embarrassing, but I'm going to do it. Um, values or preferred states, preferred states of being underpin everything. There isn't anything in life that we do personally or professionally that isn't shaped fundamentally and determined by the values that we hold. Um, as a 13 year old boy, I was um, gratefully able to go and attend a, a boarding school. But my first wee while I stayed with a, an American family who was a teacher at the school and, and the thought had not occurred to me. But when I turned up there, um, I realized that I would have to go to the bathroom during the day in the house of this strange family of Pākehās. And that was an appalling idea for me as a 13-year-old Māori boy from Takapu Wāhia. When I did my MBA, uh, my thesis was on new events of success from a Māori perspective. I looked at the correlation between the actions and characteristics of new venture success from the literature with the traditional values of Māori people, many of whom I, of which I personally held, including the value of whakamā, so for those of you who know what whakamā means, um, tell your friends who don't. Um, but, but so for me as a 13-year-old Māori boy turning up into this Pākehā family's house, feeling intensely the sense of whakamā, I got up at 2 o'clock in the morning for a couple of weeks because there was no way in God's green earth I was going to make noises and smells that those Pākehās were going to you know, have to endure. Now just think about that for a second, all right? Uh, Personal health care is, by definition, a profoundly intimate human endeavor. You're all over somebody else's body in their space, in their head, in their, you know, everything. Right? Unavoidably. Well, if you've got, and I'm just giving you one some skinny example, if, if the, the patient, the person that's coming in to see you is, do you know, do you know what happens? First, they don't come. Second, when they do, it is not an edifying experience for either of you. And third, you think you've said and they've understood and they're going to do something. Well, I'm here to tell you that isn't what happened. 
And I've just given you one example of the impact of values dissonance, world value, uh, worldview dissonance. All right, where the blazes does all that go? Well, of course, at its heart, and I've got two minutes to finish, that's all good, I can do that. At its heart, uh, the challenge in front of us is about enabling change, right? You can't do good health to people just like you can't do change to people. People have to see it, understand it, want it, uh, and make decisions repetitiously to bring about that change. Can you do that? Are you able to pay the price to get inside them, whanau? To enable them to believe truly that you are a trusted voice, a trusted face, and a trusted place. Quick reflection. You know, we get to late 2021, everyone's all, well, we've got to get our vaccination levels up to a certain level, otherwise existential threat time again. You know, ministry, the DHBs, everyone, you did, did the big central top down, do it. What happened? Nah, didn't get there. Wasn't until what? Trusted voices, trusted faces, and trusted places did their thing then. We had a chance. So where does that take us, Fano? Well, Ngāti Toa has determined that, not only in health, in all things, the only way we can have confidence in the achievement of our aspirations for enhanced well-being, prosperity and mana, not only for ourselves, but the manuhiri who live on our whenua and our rohe, is to row our own waka, paddle our own waka. You don't row a waka, but anyway. Um to act intentionally, directly, both in the creation of our horizontal integrated ecosystem of Modi order delivery, but in other capabilities. The point is, uh, we're going to do it ourselves. And the truth of the matter is, is that's because that's the only way it can be done. So what does that mean for you? Well, you decide. You decide. I don't know what your job is. I don't know what you do. But if you think about some of the things that I've shared with you today and you be honest about it and consider the impacts on your own personal practice, your own role, responsibilities, one thing I am certain of, everybody can lift where they stand. Everybody can act in a man-enhancing way. Everyone can tell the truth. And so my tono, my challenge, my whittle, my invitation to you all, here today, Fano, is consider these things that I've shared with you. I'm not in charge of the world, but I am in charge of Te Runa o Tō Rangatira. Got some of my heroes over here as well, and we are determined to row our own waka and to work intimately with our Pacifica Fano in Porirua, intimately with our refugee community in Porirua, intimately with everyone who wants to be a part of the coalition of the willing that we're looking to create in our locality in Porirua. And as we accumulate the evidence for what's possible, as Martin and his team pay us equitably for the hard work that we do and the provision of all the resourcing and you know good stuff that goes on, I am absolutely certain uh, that we'll shift the dial and great things will happen. Kia ora no tata. Nga mihi kia koe, uh, helmet for te te lava and for that uh, that challenge and it's it's been a day full of challenges but I think each and every one is just a reminder of how change is not going to be easy and it's never been easy but now is the most opportune time to do that so thank you again for that and um, on a personal personal level really looking forward to the opportunity to working together with Ngāti Toa as part of the um, locality work so um Thank you again for your time this afternoon. It's a shame we didn't get to hear your version of a Les Mis song, but maybe at the end, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs>